So what I'd like to do here today is to sort of give you a little case study on the application of some of these Web 2.0 tools in a very specific area, and that is scientific research, more specifically laboratory research. So I'm an associate professor of chemistry at Drexel, and I have a research lab. I'm a synthetic organic chemist. And uh, what we started to, to do as of 2005 is to try to be as transparent as physically possible with the research that we do and all of the metadata that's associated with that research. So I'm going to basically spend this talk showing you the, the familiar tools that you're uh, used to, like wikis and blogs, and I'll show you how they actually are useful to do that communication. But before I get into all those details, I think I need to talk more about the big picture here, um, which is that all of these tools really rely on a culture of openness. And that's something in, in the scientific community that is not necessarily homogeneous. Different fields have different you know, uh, views about openness. But this is a, sort of a trend that I've seen happening where the traditional scientific approach, you'd have uh, a traditional lab notebook, which would be unpublished. So unless you actually wrote a paper about it, no one would ever find out about the research that you did, the stuff that failed as well as the stuff that succeeded. As we move along this line here towards more openness, we have the traditional journal article. So that's good because other researchers can follow what you've been doing, but they really can't see everything. So you do represent your successes in the way that you want to represent them, but you're not representing necessarily all of your failures or really how messy everything is. And this is not totally open in the sense that you still have to buy these typically. Okay, so what's been very popular in terms of openness is this open access journal article. So what this really means, this, this, this term really has a very specific meaning, which is to make traditional journal articles where you typically have to pay for them, now you, anyone in the world can access them and download them freely. But the format of the article is exactly the same as in the, tr in the traditional publication system. So what I'd like to be showing you today is what I refer to as open notebook science, where the actual lab notebook of, of the person or group is made public. And I will use mainly a wiki to, to, to do that. But I'm going to show you a bunch of ways in which this is uh, connected. OK, so I think of all of these, probably the blog is the easiest to understand. Everybody's familiar with the blog. It's a series of posts in reverse chronological order. And initially, I thought, actually, that that's exactly what a lab notebook would be. It makes sense. One post should correspond to one experiment. But when we started to do that in the lab, that turned out to not work very well at all. And one of the main reasons is that there's so much updating that needs to be done. There's a lot of error correction, and there's a lot of contributions from different people. And a blog, of course, you lose all that information as soon as you update the post. So I'll show you a little bit later how we use a wiki to do that more effectively. But we still end up using a blog. Um, and it's kind of interesting how that has evolved. The blog is very good for certain things. It's very good for big picture uh, kind of communication. Let me show you a few examples. So for example, this is just looking the past couple of months at some of my blog posts. Um, one of the things that I discussed is funding, something that you don't typically discuss in a great detail uh, with your competitors. But I think that actually it's a lot better to go out in the open and put this there. Uh, because you know that your competitors are going to see it anyway when, when they review your proposal. So you, know, you might as well make it open. And one of the um, very convenient tools that I've used for these kinds of things is Nature Preceedings. Uh, it's, this is a fantastic tool. that it, It's run by Nature Publishing Group. And it allows you to have an editorial approval by Nature, but not peer review, not necessarily peer review. There's an open review system. Anyone can comment on your document. But it's not, uh, it doesn't go through a formal peer review system. And this is a very exciting uh, experiment, I think, because it, it allows people to experiment not just with the traditional journal article format, but with any format that they can stick into, uh, into a PDF. OK, so this is something that I've used uh, occasionally. The other thing that I've discussed is public support for some of my uh, colleagues that are trying to do their own thing. So here I'm supporting Cameron Nyland's proposal to try to get people that are interested in open science together. And this is something that a blog does very, very well. If we get some media coverage, that's something that, once again, it's fairly big picture. It's something that most people can understand. And something that I want to make a point of every time it happens, because I think it's absolutely critical, is whenever a peer-reviewed journal article cites my blog or wiki, 
that makes a connection between those two worlds that a lot of people think are extremely separate, but actually aren't. And I think that's what we're going to see moving forward. The reason that um, you know these these social software tools are going to be uh, useful is that they're going to be connected into the network of all the peer-reviewed stuff out there. So I want to make a point every time that happens. The other thing I can do, uh, and again, you notice that you haven't seen any experiments yet. Okay, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. But this shows you all of the metadata, the stuff that normally doesn't get discussed except if you go to a conference and you happen to be around with your friends, you'll talk about it. But a blog enables you to communicate who you are as a faculty member and a researcher to whoever cares. Uh, so when we get a new collaborator, that's fantastic. We can put it out there and we can uh, let, let the world know. So we've had a few collaborators in the, in the past couple of months. And I'm going to get to these details near, near the end. The other thing I can discuss are uh, presentations like this. So this is currently being recorded. And after I'm done here, I'll podcast it. I'll make a screencast. I'll make it available in a bunch of formats. And I can also talk about it on my blog you know, and whatever else uh, came up here. Another very interesting thing, not a lot of time here. just want to sort of mention it. Uh, I've been pretty active with Second Life. And uh, when I give presentations in Second Life, I can also make a note of that. So someone who would never you know, have wandered into Second Life who's following our chemistry project can think, hey, maybe there's an interesting thing going on there. And uh, Second Life is actually a fantastic tool for poster presentations. So um, I definitely will report on that. Other things that we've done in Second Life, you can represent molecules and enzymes. If anybody's interested in that, I can talk to you later about it. But again, I'm just taking samples of my blog posts in the past few months, and this is what comes up. Also done some teaching, uh, had some students create objects in Second Life. And this is kind of interesting, just out of the blue, you know, because people know that I'm working on malaria, uh, you know, they would send me uh, alerts to things that are going on. So here's a run for malaria in, in Philadelphia that I could very easily, uh, you know, alert people who are following what, what we're doing. And then once in a while, I like to talk you know, at a higher level, more general about science and what I think is going on with openness and, and what it actually means to do science. So that, this gives me a forum to, to, to do that. Now, of course, I'm talking about science. I'm talking about proposals and all these things. But these point to something that's very real. And that's our laboratory notebook. So every time I will give a post, and it refers somehow to an experiment, all of our experiments are on wiki pages. So I am able to link back to the original experiments where people who are chemists can actually understand what it is that I'm claiming that I've done. And this is the big thing about the, you know, these, these technologies, is if we want to be taken seriously as researchers, as scholars, we have to provide the necessary information to convince people that you know, we've done what we're claiming that we've done. OK, so if I'm. If I'm looking at a specific experiment, I'm just going to very quickly show you the kinds of ways that we can, we, can, we can document these. If you've ever been in a lab, you'll know that on paper, a lab notebook will typically have an objective section, and then it'll have results, et cetera. So this wiki is, is very similar to that in, in its layout. Okay, So you have an objective. And then you see you have these links here. So I have a link to a, a particular molecule. Well, if I click on that, it takes me to ChemSpider, which is an online database of about 20 million compounds. And they now actually can deal with the substructure searching. They can deal with the synonyms, all the stuff that I no longer have to deal with on my server. So, And this is a free service. And it's just a beautiful example of Web.2 technology in a, in a specific research area. I can link to the experimental plan. So my students executed that experiment, but they're basing it on a plan that I you know, wrote up somewhere. And here it is. So you can see how closely it was followed. I'm linking to docking results. So just very quickly to give you an idea of what we're doing here, we're trying to make anti-malarial compounds. So we're a synthetic organic chemistry group. So there are people who are experts at docking, which basically is just computer simulations trying to figure out which compounds should work. And then we have people who test those compounds. So here, we're actually able to link to an experiment, which is actually a computer experiment that was run by Rajarshi Guha, one of our collaborators. And this is really where the beef is. Um, because normally, if, you are, if you're a synthetic organic chemist and you talk about docking, 
it's not really shouldn't be in that paper. So they'll you know they'll say it was docked by so and so. But here you can actually go to the specific details, including you know the actual molecules that that person you know said that we should make, and that can be explored. That can be criticized, and you know people can make comments about you know if that's good or not the way we did it. We have a procedure section which is very similar to what you'd find in a regular publication. But this here is, is probably the coolest part. It's having people interact with the data in, in a way that's just absolutely impossible with paper, never mind open or closed. Here we have, in, in chemistry as in many sciences, we have spectra. And spectra are just basically pictures uh, where you have to interpret the spectra to pull out information about the experiment. The problem with spectra is typically in a, in a journal, they're PDFs and they're published like this. And you can see here, this is a line, and those little bumps here, and I really can't tell what's going on with this peak. And sometimes that's actually fortunate for the, for the researcher because you don't always necessarily you know, want to show uh, your dirty laundry. Here you can actually expand, anyone in the world can expand any of these peaks, can dig into the information. You can see that you know, this was a triplet down here, but it's actually not perfect. And there are, so there are many issues here that we can explore and we can, and we can you know, analyze it in much, much greater detail. So finally, when you read the conclusion, this, this Yugi product was obtaining 59% yield, that statement actually is backed up by all of the raw data. And so there's this sort of uh, philosophy here of having no privileged information in our group. If you know, everyone has access to the raw data, everyone in the world who's you know, capable of analyzing it should be able to come to the same conclusion. And if they don't, then we want to know about that, obviously. In terms of finding information, so, um, you know, in terms of chemistry, there's some very specific ways of tagging molecules. Um, this is not uh, a talk about chemistry, but just very briefly, there are these things called inchy keys and inchies, and uh, they happen to get indexed pretty efficiently by Google. So if I'm searching for a chemical compound, like here, terbutalized cyanide, this actually may have very many different names, very many common names. And if you search for it on Google, yes, you'll find stuff, but you won't find everything. There are ways of representing this in, in, in letters that uh, are unique for that particular molecule. And again, we're leveraging Google in the same way that we've leveraged ChemSpider to uh, help us search for molecules. Now, in order to tell what's going on, it's nice to have you know, the lab notebook view. But what we're starting to do now is to go more and more into data analysis and representation. And this is where things like Google Docs comes in very handy. Once again, it's, it's, it's a free service. It's something where if you have a spreadsheet, you can share it and you can work on it as a group. Um, now, not anyone can come in and modify. You have to invite people. But you can make it public. You can publish it in real time all the time. And that's, you know, a very nice tool. Uh, so a wiki wouldn't be very good at this. And the most important section of all this, uh, which is never published in traditional journal articles, is the logs. Because the logs tell you, or should tell you, exactly what the student did and observed at the time. Not after they had a chance to think about it, but at the time when they're you know, relatively unbiased. And this is really, you know, if you can't reproduce something that you find in a, in a paper, this is what you want. You want to have the log of the experiment, and you typically can't get access to that. So this is, you know, one of the one of the things that um, I'm very excited about the fact that you know this actually works. You can you can keep a lab notebook using a simple wiki, free hosted service, and it actually works pretty well. Now one of the things that we're getting involved now is actually moving from not only the human readable format, but rewriting these logs in a machine friendly format. So in the, in the log in a, on a paper notebook or on the wiki, I'm not telling my students how to write. I'm just saying record what you did, what you observed. But here we can translate that into, you know, certain, into a script where the, you know, every term has a specific meaning. So you know, I can add something, I can vortex, uh, I can wait. So all these things can be reproduced and understood by a machine and can be indexed like that. And you know, looking at results that way enables me to re-slice the data and view it in ways that would be completely impossible with a paper notebook. So this is something actually that I'm very excited about that we're able to, so we want definitely first priority is we want humans to be able to read this, but the, lo the longer perspective here is we want to move more and more towards 
you know, machine readability. And that could include librarians who just want to index some of this stuff. It could be anybody. And so a way of finding it, one of the ways is we just keep a table of contents very similar to what you'd see in a paper notebook. The other very nice thing about a wiki is you can see the recent changes. So this, I use uh, wiki spaces, which uh, I think is you know, very, very good for these purposes. And you can click recent changes and what you'll see is basically everything that's happened in my lab, you'll see who's done it, you'll see which experiment or which page. It's not all experiments, you know, there's a lot of other stuff going on. And you can actually track, you know, uh, with the goings on in my lab basically very easily. For each page, you can also track all the different changes. So nothing ever gets deleted on, on a wiki. So if there's an error and I come in and I correct it or I make a statement to the student to fix it, all of these, cha all of these changes are recorded in, in a history. So that, and, and these, are, these are recorded by a third party timestamp. So it's not on my server, all right? So basically, if you don't trust the time, you can go talk to Wikispaces. But I think that's gonna be more, you know, more uh, trustworthy. And so here you can actually say that you knew something and you can prove that you knew it when you knew it. Science is not, uh, science is not like a blog post where you go do your experiment, you, you type it up that afternoon and you're done. These things actually drag on for weeks and months because you keep rethinking about it, you make mistakes, lots and lots of mistakes, and that's just the way science is. And here we can actually you know, record that. So another neat uh, benefit from this is if, if some people are interested in how science actually works, this way of recording it, you actually have an archeology span of the process. So you could actually quantify you know, how, how many times a student made a mistake or what kind of mistakes or, you know, when did they come up with a, a conclusion. So, you know, having someone come up with a thesis and having all this background information, I think, could be very useful. So comparing the two versions of any page, so knowing that there's a change was, is, is one thing, but I'm more interested in seeing what the change was. Uh, most wikis, including Wikispaces, makes that very easy. If I compare two versions, the new stuff is in green and the deleted stuff is in red, so it's very simple. So I, I talked about the table of contents to find our experiments. The other way, of course, is uh, mainly through, through Google. So it's not necessarily people who are subscribed to our feeds, if they're just searching for things and happening to find it. And this is absolutely critical. And it's, you know, this, this old model of the top-down approach where, you know, you have these silos and if you want to find something out, you first have to find the repository. That's no longer the world that we're in, I think. I think people will just Google it and whatever comes up, comes up. And Google is very generous for people who keep blogs, are pretty active with blogs and wikis. So I think it's, it's really a good thing. Uh, a couple of more things about what you can do with this that you can't do with a, with a traditional publication. I can, in the wiki, I can describe in great detail our failures. And this is actually really important because how you fail is actually much more important than the fact that you failed. And, and so, you know, I'm not relying on some editor to make a decision about this. This is what happened. And if you're interested, you'll find it by Googling some of these things and it'll hopefully be, be helpful. One of the interesting things about this is that, you know, we have collaborators in different groups. And it turns out that for having, for interacting with people in other groups, a wiki is not necessarily the best vehicle. It turns out that the traditional mailing list is much easier for people to use. So if you're just trying to get input from people, what, what I found is that you should also have a mailing list as one of those technologies. So each of these technologies has its role and they take some time to figure out what, what, what they're good at. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned previously, this is where we are in the middle here between the theoretical people and the people who are testing. And I'm very happy to report, actually, that uh, about two months ago, we've got two compounds that uh, tested active uh, against, against malaria. So they're not strongly active, but it's, it's much more than what I expected. And it sort of proves that you can do all of this open science, uh, an entire loop of it, not just the synthetic part. And, you know, there's, there's just so many ways that this has been beneficial. Probably the most beneficial has been finding collaborators. Gus Rosania is a collaborator that came on board a couple of months ago. You know, there's a lot of people that want to go open. They just haven't taken the time to see how you can do it. And he liked what we were doing. And so now his research is Open Notebook. And one of the projects that we're sharing 
is he's actually looking at red blood cells and trying to build models so that we can, you know, he can predict if our compounds will be active or not. So, you know, it's, you couldn't ask for better. Other people have been um, also going open notebook. Uh, Cameron Nylon from University of Southampton is another one. Now, he doesn't use a wiki. He actually uses a blogging platform, but he modifies it so that the versions can be tracked. And what I'd like to leave you with here is really, you know, not all, just all of the stuff that's going on that's immediate. Uh, I think if we look to the longer picture with all of this, I think that we will look back and see that this was really the time where human activity was, you know, it was able to represent it in such a way that machines from anywhere in the world could relatively easily access things. We're not there yet, definitely. But as we make these things easier and easier, I think we're going to move to a world where, from where we have scientists talking to each other to a world where we're almost at, where scientists are interacting with machines. And hopefully in my lifetime, we'll get to see some where machines are interacting with other machines, forming hypotheses, executing experiments, and analyzing them. And uh, that's all I have. <laughs>